So, some 1 Corinthians chapter 12, continuing where Kemper left off. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually you're members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. So there was this guy named Akiva, and he was a master teacher. And he would walk from village to village teaching in various synagogues and schools. And then one evening when he was walking home, he was kind of lost in thought, and he made a left when he should have made a right. And he ended up inadvertently walking straight up to this Roman military compound. And the guard on the wall saw him before he saw the guard. And he calls down from the wall and he says, who are you, and what are you doing here? And Akiva stopped in his tracks. And he looked up at the guard and he said, How much do they pay you, sir? And the guard was confused by that question. What do you mean? What, how much do they pay me? And Akiva said, Well, I'd like to know how much they pay you, because I want to offer you twice as much to come to my house every morning and ask me those same two questions. Who are you, and what are you doing here? Let's pray together as we get started. Father in heaven, pray that you would help us to hear your word tonight, that you'd show us who we are, and you'd show us what you would have us to do here. Amen. So I asked a question on Facebook the other day. Some of you might have seen it. And the question was, what's the biggest obstacle keeping people from going to church? And it didn't seem like a very provocative question to me, to tell you the truth. But I was wrong. <laughs> See, I figured most, most, most people would basically say something either like, I'm lazy and I don't want to change, or church people hurt my feelings. That's what I figured. And I was, I was pretty much right. A lot of people basically said one of those things. I mean, they didn't exactly put it in those words, but that's what it sounded like to me. Because they said they wanted to sleep in on Sunday morning. They said they didn't have time to go to church. They're just too busy. They said they were afraid that, the, afraid that they went to church, people would judge them or they wouldn't fit in. They wondered why they would go why they would want to go to a place where they would just sit and feel guilty about all the stuff that they do, all the things they've done, and they don't really want to be told what to do anyway. Some people said they just don't trust people to teach God's word because, I mean, look at all the different denominations, the different churches. It kind of seems like nobody can agree with what it says. A few people said the only thing that they ever hear churches do is just ask for money. That's all they're interested in. And guys, I expected all of those answers, you know? But other people said they didn't see the point in going to church. They didn't see the value. What's in it for me? Because see, a lot of people these days, they've grown up not being part of a church. So they're about as likely to walk into a church as we are to suddenly start going to a Buddhist temple or a mosque. I mean, that's not gonna happen. But what I didn't expect was all the 
passionate outpouring of emotion around the idea of, I don't have to go to church to go to heaven. I can worship God all by myself in the privacy of my own home. And that's where the conversation kept going. It kept getting back there. I mean, I asked them what gets in the way of going to church, and their answer was, I don't have to go to church, and you can't make me go to church. You know, if we spoke with half the enthusiasm about why we do go to church, as they spoke about why they don't go to church, I think we might just change the world. And they tried to justify their not church with all kinds of spiritual sounding rationalizations like Jesus never said anything about going to church, dude. Or, you know, where two or three are gathered. Or my private time with God, it's being alone in the woods or with my family or it's just me and Jesus and that's all I need. Kind of like Steve Martin in The Jerk. Me and Jesus and this lamp, and that's all I need, and my dog. And then the dog runs back into the house and says, I don't need my dog. So you just rationalize everything. You see, the thing is, people can believe whatever they want to believe, but it doesn't make it true. Because God's word clearly tells us, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints, as some have done. In other words, some Christians, in the early days of Christianity, they had stopped going to church for whatever reason. And God said to knock it off. Get over yourself, get off your lazy butt, and go to church. But do you have to go to church to go to heaven? See, that's the question. Is it a requirement for salvation? Are we doomed to eternal damnation if we sleep in on Sunday morning or stay home on Saturday night? Well, let me ask the question a different way. See, if the church, if the church is the body of Christ, like it says in that scripture that we read tonight, if the church is the body of Christ, the saved, the redeemed people of God, then can you go to heaven without being part of the church? And the answer clearly is no, of course not. I mean, by definition, the people who go to heaven are the people who are the church. So yeah, you have to be in the church to go to heaven. That's what the church is. The church is the redeemed, the ones who inherit the kingdom of heaven. Oh, but you say that's different, Frank, because that's not talking about going to church. That's talking about being the church. Okay, fine, fair enough, good. And that's exactly why God told us in Hebrews not to forsake the gathering of the saints. Because you are the church. So be the church. You guys remember that time when Jesus said to follow him and then someone spoke up and said that's cool I'll follow you in my heart at home where it's safe and Jesus was totally all right with that you know because he's Jesus yeah I don't remember that either <laughs> see being a member of the body of Christ it's not a personal private thing religion is not a private personal thing it's always going to work itself out into the rest of our lives. Our theology will flow from our minds to our heart, and to our words, and to our actions. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a teenager who asks their parents if they have to eat dinner with the family, or if they have to be at family functions in order to remain in the family in order to inherit the family estate. And they say, I don't want to be around my brothers and sisters. They're too annoying. I don't, I don't want to be around grandma and grandpa. They're too old. I just want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and I don't want to do any dishes, or mow the lawn, or take out the trash. 
See, right there, that's a brat. That's what we have right there. We have a brat. <laughs> and a good parent will sit down with them and explain a thing or two. First, they would tell them that they love them and how much they love them. There's, they're loved and there's absolutely nothing they can do that's going to change that. But their lack of interest in the rest of the family, their selfishness is disturbing. See, you're a part of this family. So be a part of this family. So what does that mean concerning the church? What does it mean to be the church? And I'll tell you one thing. It means it's not all about you. It's not all about me. In that 1 Corinthians passage that we read earlier, it was talking about how the different members of the body each have their own role to play, right? How they shouldn't be jealous of each other. How they should serve each other and work together in love. Some prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, some pastors, which kind of sounds a whole lot like a church, doesn't it? Pastors, evangelists, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But it also talks about administration, miracle, tongues, healing, helping. The point is that each one of us brings different talents and abilities and interests to the body. See, we're supposed to gather together as Christ's body, as the church. We're supposed to do this at least once a week because we need to hear his word when we're all gathered together like this. Amen. We need to hear the promise that we're forgiven and loved because we will forget that. We need to pray together. We need to praise and thank God together. We need to encourage each other, hold each other up, hold each other accountable. We need to serve each other, find ways to serve our community together because we're not supposed to do any of these things in isolation. It's not good for people to be alone really not supposed to be all about you or me. Church shopping. Church shopping is the worst. It is. But when you're looking for the church that God wants you to be part of, you shouldn't just be looking for the prettiest building, you know, so that you can like take really cool selfies when the service is over. My church. We shouldn't be looking for the church that just has the most handsome and charming preacher with a great sense of humor and a blue jacket who likes to take long walks on the beach and hold hands. No, we shouldn't be looking for the church with the coolest music or with an awesome children's program or an awesome youth program or a singles ministry or whatever it is that you think is going to be really great for you because we're supposed to be looking for the place where we can do what God has called us to do in that place. The place where he wants us to fill a need, to be a blessing, to serve a purpose. One of the biggest tragedies that happens when people just skip out on church is the void they leave in their absence. The things they're supposed to be doing, they're just left undone. There's no one else who can do what God has called you to do. In the body of Christ, when you don't show up, it's like we're missing an eye or an ear. Wouldn't it be weird if you woke up one morning and your elbows just decided to sleep in? And you'd be like trying to eat your toast and drink your coffee, but you couldn't bend your arms. And you're looking all over the house for some kind of long straw and you're just walking around with your arms straight out, just making a mess. You know, you skip out on church one week, and maybe that was the week when you were supposed to sit next to a particular person and say something encouraging or help them in some way. Maybe you were the one who was supposed to teach that Sunday school class on that particular day because that was the one time that this one child was going to come and visit who would have really resonated with you. You know, whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing, it can only be done by you. That's why God made you. And that's why he called you. 
be part of a specific church. And it's why he has more than one local church, you know? It was almost two years ago that people started coming up to me and asking if I would be interested in starting a new church in Katy. And by the time five or six people had mentioned the idea to me, and I started to actually take it kind of seriously, well, I prayed about it one night before I went to bed, and that night I had this crazy dream. Now, I've had lots of crazy dreams that don't have anything to do with anything. Dreams about flying over my childhood neighborhood and seeing all the old houses. Dreams about showing up to school in my underwear. Yeah. Not being able to find my locker. Dreams about spiders descending from the ceiling to my face while I'm asleep. See, dreams are weird. They are. But this dream was different because I dreamed that I started a church in the athletic performance lab of Katie. And in the dream, I saw how we could set up chairs and stage and lights how we could use TV screens instead of projectors. And I woke up the next morning and I thought, huh, that could actually work. But I still wasn't completely convinced that that's what I was supposed to do. So I prayed again. And I said, God, I'll tell you what, I will try to get a hold of the owners of the lab and I'll tell them about my crazy idea and what I was thinking was, I would tell them the idea, and then they could turn me down, and then that could be the end of it. So I looked them up on Facebook, I sent them a private message, and I set up a meeting for the next night. And they agreed to meet. And we met in the conference room right back there. I met with Trace and Tammy Boyd, and I told them my idea about starting a new church in their facility. I told them about my dream. And they started finishing my sentences. They loved the idea. And they have been amazingly supportive and generous to this ministry. In fact, I left that night with keys and an alarm code. And with the conviction that we were really supposed to do this thing. So we met for the first time in this room about a week later on a Saturday night sitting in lawn chairs, I had an acoustic guitar, standing there on the astroturf, worshiping Jesus. And that was 99 Saturdays ago, guys. Yeah. <laughs> See, the idea of new church is to be our third place. You know, your, your home is your first place, and your work or your school, that's your second place. But everybody needs a third place. And your third place is just as important to your identity as the first two. Because it's the place where you meet your friends. And you're there because you want to be there. It's like Cheers. It's like the diner on Seinfeld. It's the coffee shop on Friends. See, we wanted to create a church that could be people's third place. But in order for that to really be the case, it has to be accessible during the week. It has to be open more than just a couple hours a week, you know? A few years ago, I was at this worship conference in Kansas City, and after all the day's activities, a bunch of us wanted to go out and have a beer at some local place in Kansas City, so I opened up Yelp, and I found a place that looked interesting called Llewellyn's Pub, and it was located in a 100-year-old church building. And it looked on Yelp like a pretty good place to hang out. So we ended up going there every night that week. And, and the whole time that I'm sitting there, I couldn't stop thinking about how amazing it would be to like, like if I owned that place and if we had worship services on Sunday morning. I mean, like we were a pub, a restaurant all week, get to know people like only a bartender can, you know? Eat with people, drink with people celebrate and weep with them and then in that same space worship God and do ministry see that would be a third place for me you know 
And that's what I want New Church to be when we grow up and move out. When we move out of the lab and we move into our own place someday, I want it to be something like that. So, we've got a year or so to grow, to be the size of congregation, to make that happen. I figured we need about 250 people who are showing up here every week in worship, invested in this ministry, who have bought into the vision, to rolling up their sleeves, they're worshiping God, they're loving people, and then, then we can find a place to make our, our permanent home, the New Church Pub or New Church Cafe or whatever we're going to call it. A version of New Church that's open every day, so it can be our third place. But it's also open to the public, so it can be a third place for a bunch of other people, people who need to know the love and the grace of God. Doesn't that sound like something worth doing? Yeah. yeah? Doesn't that sound like a great way to reach people with the gospel? To get to know people who probably aren't going to show up at a typical church? So we need to grow. If we're ever going to be able to do anything like that, we need to grow. Which is why it's time to move to Sunday morning. We always knew this day was going to come. We only started meeting on Saturday night because it allowed us to borrow musicians and tech guys and pastors from other churches who met on Sunday mornings. And now we've grown to the point that we can afford to make this switch. Most of the time when I tell people about new church, they're intrigued, they're interested, until I tell them we meet on Saturday night. And then they're like, Saturday, huh? And I'll bet you guys have had the same reaction from people you've talked to. Because Saturdays are tough. But I think Sunday morning is still somewhat set aside in our culture for at least the possibility of church. So I'm hoping that making this move will make it possible for a whole bunch more people to join us. We conducted a survey a couple months ago to find out if most of us would be able to make the switch. And we found out that of the people who call New Church home, people who call it their primary church, over 98% said if we met on Sunday morning, they'd be there. They'd be able to come. The survey made it pretty clear that this is about as good a time as we're ever going to have to make this change. So a big change is coming. Our first Sunday morning service is going to be February 19th at 10.30, right in here. It's about a month away. It's also gonna be our two year anniversary. So let's start spreading the news, start spreading the word, let's start telling people, okay? Who are you and what are you doing here? That's the question, questions that we should never stop asking ourselves. Who are we? Who are we? We're new church, what are we doing? We're trying to be about the business of worshiping God and loving people in the particular way that he's called us to do it. And we're not there yet. We've got a long way to go before we can be that cafe or pub that people will call their third place. But we have come a long way in a couple of years. This pretty much looks like the church I saw in the dream that I had a couple of years ago. I'm really glad that all you guys are here doing this with me. We're not going to give up. The devil might try to discourage us. He might try to divide us. He might tempt us to obsess over petty details and petty things and lose our way. But we're not going to hear it. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep pressing on towards being the people that God has called us to be, the church he's called us to be, and to do the things that he's called us to do keep worshiping God. We're going to keep worshiping God because he first loved us. It was his big idea to save us and to make us his children. So we're going to keep showing up and learning how to worship him. And we're going to keep learning how to love people. Because otherwise we can clang all the cymbals and make all this noise and do all these things. We can get together and just do this thing. But if we don't love the people that God sends through those doors, if we don't love them, 
then this is just all a bunch of nothing. So there needs to be about 250 of us before we can make this next step, before we can get our own place. So please join me in praying that those people will join us, to join us in our mission, to show up with their sleeves rolled, following Jesus, ready to get to work, ready to chip in. Actually, I want you to think of specific people that you would like to join us. Think of them. And I'd like you to pray that God will lead those people here, that God will open up opportunities for you to talk to them, to invite them. Pray for God to put people on your heart, the people that he wants to be here, so we can know who we're supposed to be praying for and who we should be inviting to join us. Guys, we got about a year to make this happen. So let's get to work. Here's the blessing. May we be the church that God has called us to be. The people God has called us to be. May God give us the strength and the grace to do the work that he's called us to do. And may we realize that we're only in this church because he wants us to be here. It's only because of the love and grace of God who sent his only son to be our Lord and Savior. That's the only reason we get to be in church. So may we know in the deepest way that the cross and the resurrection happened for us. And then may we take that message to everyone we meet. The message of the gospel, that everything Jesus did, he did for you. Amen.